The floor is yours, Conservation Council of New Brunswick. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for inviting us, and thank you for your efforts on this committee. I know you've got a very broad agenda, and you're discussing some outrageously huge topics, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, with respect to listening to people from um, uh, giving you testimony on, on today and this week's topic to your um, earlier efforts um, to, all the way forward to when you report back to the legislature, but also just personally, um, thank you so much for all you've done to help us um, through this crisis. I know that you've all stood up and helped your constituents day by day maneuver one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced in the province, and I really wanted to pass on my thank you for that um, personally. I don't think we can say thanks enough. My gosh, it's been quite a few months, hasn't it? Thank you. I could talk all day on this stuff, but I know that the chair will let me know when I have five minutes to go, right? <coughs> um, Mr. Stewart, thank you. Today I'm going to take you through a very high level um, conversation to help set your stage, I think, for the conversations in the days to come. I'll focus in on Crown Forest. Let me just say why. Um, we can talk about uh, herbicide and pesticide use in agriculture any day, but it is entirely a different topic. And I would recommend that you pursue um, that conversation in a, in, um, a, on another day. But I'm gonna, I've chosen to focus primarily on herbicide use in our crown forest because it's the largest source. I want to take you through some slides, which I'll go through really quickly, I think, on the extent of use of um, herbicides in New Brunswick forest. I want to point you to some new articles uh, that are popping up all over the place in peer-reviewed scientific journals. I want to talk to you about what's pushing the bans in other parts of the world, the key factors. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about how Quebec managed to ban the use of herbicides on its crown forests quite a few years ago now, and I'll leave you with some recommendations. Okay. I have to do this. Do you want me to do this for me? It's just our acknowledgement. This is our acknowledgement statement. This is from um, the chief medical. Look how I have to use one. So this is from the chief medical officer's health report in um, 2016, almost uh, uh, five years ago now. Came out in September of that year. And the reason I put this data up in front of you is to show that even though we're relatively small forests with a large percentage of crown forests in our makeup, um, we use a substantial amount of herbicides. Now this data is all forests, not just crown forests, so be clear about that. Um, that's what the Chief Medical Officer of Health did. She combined everything. And I've thrown some other provinces up there for comparison using the all forest data. And I've also, this wasn't in the, in the Medical Officer of Health report in 2016, I've thrown in Maine for comparison. Okay, to just give you that sort of sense of, well here on the left hand side are two very large provinces with very extensive forest practices and forest management in their crown forests using um, less per capita in their crown forests than New Brunswick. And of course, the little 3D thing of Quebec there shows you zero force um, in Quebec, force sprayed in Quebec. So who actually carries out this um, spraying? This is a big, wide graph. All of this data comes from um, Enercan through their national forestry um, management um, statistics. They've been keeping that, department's been keeping those statistics since 1990 and all of the, all of the provinces feed up that data to the national inventory. So this is New Brunswick data. And it shows you the area of the, and this one is just specific to Crown Forest. Remember the one before was a combo forest? private plus crown. This is specific to crown force and it shows you the companies that are spraying hectares in the crown force over time. Okay, so they just got all different color coded. And the very next slide is just your, is exactly the same data, just a little bit easier to bite or chew off. It's a um, shorter time frame 
from 2013 to 2020. Remember back at the beginning, I said there's a lot of new science. There's nothing like the IARC report, the uh, report on um, glyphosate as um, uh, possible as a carcinogen. It sparked a whole new bunch of scientific studies into the fate of glyphosate in, our, in nature and some um, uh, new science coming out on the impacts on human health. And I have to tell you, members, there's very seldom a day goes by that I don't see a new peer-reviewed scientific article about new uh, research that's found impact. So all I've done is picked some headlines from the science journals to give you a sense of this developing field um, but also where um, herbicides are showing up, where we have been told for the last 30 years they wouldn't show up. So you can see um, there's been studies out of McGill University looking at how derivatives of this herbicide um, can leach um, phosphorus out of agriculture and forest soils. Um, you can see where um, some scientists out in BC are seeing residues of glyphosate in uh, berries and the, the one that I read last week was on the prickly rose. If you've been out in, in New Brunswick in the, our crown forest, you've seen the, our version of the prickly rose. So there, well, I guess what I'm saying is that this, these new bodies of science coming in with impact on water impact on plants, impact on mammals, and impact on vertebrates, including human vertebrates. Um, there's a wealth of it. It's very hard to keep a top of. And nor would I expect you, um, as lay people and great leaders from your communities, that you would. But I did want to show, I didn't want to bring in a big stack of, of science for you to have to read. Um, scientists, as you know, are pretty smart people and, and you can find most of these, these articles in French and in English languages. Um, and they, in the abstracts, they definitely explain the scope of their investigations. I want to touch now, and this is um, an ever-changing database. Where is it banned? It's banned in a lot of places, a lot of jurisdictions all over the world. The big bans that people follow, of course, are the countrywide bans. France, Austria, Mexico, Argentina. The big region-wide bans, the um, debate uh, within the European community itself. But there's also been cities municipalities and regions in all of these countries that have almost always gone up before um, their federal governments or the, even their state or provincial governments and brought in restrictions primarily on the cosmetic use of, of herbicides. So that would be on municipal um, golf courses, municipal grounds and people's lawns. Trying to get at that unnecessary use of uh, herbicides, that very much um, a part of the conversation. The two or three most recent ones that I thought were important was Germany's commitment to phase it out by 2024, France's commitment to phase it out by the end of this year, and then also from a commercial or um, uh, market use when Kellogg's committed to not buy products spayed, uh, sprayed with glyphosate by 2024. So that's your Cheerios, your Corn Flakes, you know, they use a lot of grain and they've been pushed obviously by their consumers um, to bring, to ask their farmers to grow things differently. If you only, I'll go to the next slide, if you only read one paper, this is the one that I would recommend. And um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I would, uh, any of these papers that I cited are available and I can email them either to the, the clerk or to individual members. I should have said that at the beginning, sorry, um, Chairperson. But if there's only one paper that you read, it should be this one, 2016, a consensus statement 
by health scientists in response to the IARC report, and these are their seven consensus statements. Glyphosate-based herbicides are the most heavily applied in the world and the, its usage continues to rise. Worldwide, they are often found contaminating drinking water sources, rain, snow, and air, especially in agricultural reason, it, regions. The half-life of glyphosate in water and soil is much longer than the earlier science on the chemical told us. Uh, it's widely present in the global soybean um, supply. Human exposure to um, glyphosate-based herbicides is rising. It's now authoritatively classified as a possible human carcinogen, and we can talk about that in the question period. And regulatory estimates of tolerable daily intakes in the United States, the European Union, are based on outdated science. And I, you can put, because Health Canada so closely follows the US EPA in its regulatory approach. The scientists didn't say that. That's why I didn't put in Canada. Um, but I think you, can, you definitely can leap to that. What's driving the, sci the science and these bans? First, the IARC report out of um, 2015. Like I mentioned, this new scientific um, evidence. Public concern, you cannot discount the fact that over 35,000 New Brunswickers have written into some of you and signed petitions, and a lot of you have stood up in the House and presented these petitions, thank you very much, saying that they are concerned about it and asking for their government to move to phase it out in the Crown Force. And of course, the multi-million dollar lawsuits are really pushing it hard. So as you, and just a couple of weeks ago, um, Bayer settled for um, 12 billion to settle um, these older lawsuits that they had lost in court in the US on. Um, and they've also just recently settled a new case in um, Sacramento for 25 million. So concern over litigation based on um, health impacts is really driving. I'm going to switch over now to um, back up what I've said about um, the people of New Brunswick are concerned. As recently as August and early September of last year, we conducted some public polling province-wide, a sample size of 500. So as you know, that's a very good double dip, double sized um, public opinion poll to add, uh, along with the Atlantic Salmon Federation, Canadian Parks and Wilderness, New Brunswick Chapter and the Conservation Council to ask them a whole number of questions um, about what they thought about the state of the forest. And I'm just, I have all that data, I have that data with me if you want to drill down a little bit in the question period about it. But I wanted to draw your attention to this. 76%, um, over three quarters of New Brunswickers don't want to see um, herbicides such as glyphosate used in their forest. 87%, and this is kudos to the department, want the government to keep its promise on more protected land. And New Brunswickers' top concern about what's happening in the Crown Forest, clear cutting and logging. Let me tell you a bit about what happened in Quebec. Over 20, almost 30 years ago now, there was quite a controversy, not just in Quebec, all over Canada and the world, about the use of 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T as the common pesticides of the day. At the time, the government instructed a panel, BAPE, you've probably heard about them, to go out and hold public hearings um, uh, about to get citizens, scientists, other policy experts opinion about the use of herbicides in the crown forest and they reported back with a general recommendation that herbicides of all types including glyphosate should be phased out of use in the Quebec forest um, by uh, 2011. They went back to the people five years later to hear more and again they stuck to that recommendation and the government stuck to that recommendation, changed the Crown Forest Act, and it's been banned 
for use in the Crown Forest um, since that date. And I thought it might be interesting for you to see um, a, pretty, um, a review that was conducted by the Canadian Forest Service, and I understand you have a couple of experts from CFS in over the next few days. Um, but this review was conducted by them to sort of see how was it working? How did they survive? You can imagine the doom and gloom um, that Quebec uh, leaders heard from industry about we'll, we'll all go bankrupt. Um, but what they found was that, um, we, th that foresters needed to pay more attention to veg uh, vegetation management, that Quebec was adequately releasing its, its seedlings um, mechanically and with crews on most sides. On most sites, it was based on early reforestation, the use of taller planting stock, and intensive mechanical release. Um, it brought, it was able, they were able to, these companies that operate in, in the Quebec Crown Forest, was able to bring crop trees um, to the free to grow stage without the crutch, which out, without the use of herbicides, and without resulting in major effects of uh, the crop that they were growing. And the scientists from CFS said it, that this vegetation management strategy and this is, I think, the important part from my perspective, is an important asset in the implementation of an ecosystem-based management. If you want to get back to nature, something that respects nature, then this will work. So I'll flip you right last. Am I almost, how am I doing? We're good, thank you. Our Crown Force and Lands Act hasn't been updated for 30 years. You need to update it. I know that's not the job of this committee. The minister has heard this 87 times, maybe 89 times from me. Um, so I apologize for the repetition, minister. If you want to get at the use of um, herbicides in our Crown Force, you have to recommend that the government reduce the size of clear cuts. Herbicides are kind of a symptom of a problem like a crutch when you have a sprained ankle or a broken leg. It's a symptom of a broader problem, which is large-scale clear-cutting. If you can bring down the size of clear-cutting in the Crown Forest, and if you can bring down clear-cuts about it to clear-cuts of five years ago um, more often, um, then you can dramatically reduce herbicide use in the Crown Forest. You've got to make a recommendation to the legislature that you stop using taxpayers' money to pay for this. It will help the industry adjust when you stop cutting checks um, for poisons in the Crown Forest. You need to, I think, make a recommendation that you um, have a policy, uh, that you support a policy intention to phase it out. I would prefer that you move really quickly on that. I know the ledge isn't sitting, um, but you can um, um, make a, a unanimous statement as soon as possible that we need to figure out how to phase it out. Some other activists will want it stopped tomorrow, but if we look to the Quebec picture and um, look to changes in Crown Force, we know that this doesn't happen at, the, at lightning speed, and you do need to give the industry some time to adapt and to build up their workforces and their crews. Um, but you do need to ban it. Um, you're going to hear from industry, can't do anything, I can't do anything different than the way we've been doing things for 20 years. Can't do it differently. Um, I just don't buy it. I think there's an awful lot of smart foresters in this province. I think there's an awful lot of talent within the industry. And when they put their mind to it, they can do it. They'll still be able to employ people to run their pulp mills, um, to work in the woods. Um, but if we don't have legislators standing up with citizens and scientists saying you've got to move this, it w they will, the industry will not change. Think about reform of crown forestry as a fairness umbrella. And underneath this fairness umbrella is government to government negotiation with First Nations sorely overdue. Under this fairness umbrella, 
It's taking timber supply and wood supply from private woodlot owners before you dip into nature on Crown lands. Under this fairness umbrella comes all the small furry animals, all the birds, the butterflies, the insects um, that live and survive in our forest. So you've got, I, I don't really like this phrase, but you've got a perfect storm. You've got the crisis of climate change coming up at you. You've got the crisis in nature coming up at you. You've got this fairness, access to fairness, demand in front of you. And you've got overwhelming public support to figure out how to wrestle this to the ground and just say, the, um, thank you very much, see you later, um, on glyphosate use in the Crown Forest. As I told you, I could talk all day, but I won't. And the chair was so nice and polite. I think I'll leave it there. Um, and I'll take any questions through your chair. Thank you. We'd like to thank you, uh, thank the Conservation Council for the presentation. Very informative. We appreciate it. Um, who would like to speak first? Emily Bacchus? Go ahead. Um, just a few quick questions, just for my own knowledge. What is IARC? Sorry? Oh. I've got to get the acronym right. In international Association for Research on Council. It's an in international agency, sorry. It is an um, arm's length body established by the WHO, World I'm Health sorry, what Organization. was it? International Agency on? Research on Cancer. Okay. And it came, sorry about that, I should have um, put that in a footnote. Um, came out in 2015. Yes. With a health. Um, hazard report, not a risk assessment report, though, and they're kind of confusing, but I can explain that to you um, if you need to, but uh, I'm saying that um, this chemical that we're discussing is a probable carcinogen. Okay. All right, thank you. And on the bottom of that same page, uh, what New Brunswickers say about the state of their forest, did you say only 500 people were surveyed? 500, yeah. Okay. So a pretty good sample size for New Brunswick is 250, so we double sampled. Okay. Um, so that's a pretty, that's very representative, 19 out of 20, um, right? Um, it's a very good sample size. Like when you poll in your riding, if you did uh, 500, that would be a lot, <laughs> right? So. Right. Good. And uh, living without herbicides, I do notice that um, you didn't mention, but in this, there's two exceptions in Quebec. Right. Blueberry yeah, operations was, and yeah. power line right of ways. Right. Okay. So there was a very, in the northern boreal in Quebec, there's a very uh, large region um, called uh, Lac St. John, uh, St. John Lake region, uh, where it's, it, it's uh, big blueberry um, fields. But because it was such a small percentage of the overall, um, the, the government at, of the day decided to, to ban it. And I think you will hear from blueberry growers, from farmers, yes. and from other users. Um, that's fine, but for today's and this week's de deliberations, it's a bit of a diversion. You want to go after the big source first, and then help farmers make the transition to other to other users. But in, we've never. Um, it's. I just think it, that's why they accept they accepted it. And we have a much larger blueberry growing population Not as large here. as this one. Not oh, really? as large so as in Quebec. No. So it's bigger. Yes. Okay. And they. Did not ban it there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. And then Minister Holland, you can use up the rest of the time. <laughs> well, just have a, I just have a couple. Oh, sorry, okay. Always a pleasure to be in the room with you again. I love having a chance to talk about all things ecology with you. I just have a couple of quick questions. On the slide where it talks about glyphosate use ban throughout the world, mm -hmm. Do you have, or are you able to uh, get percentages of how much uh, of the use in those jurisdictions was mm. cosmetic or commercial versus forestry? I can. It'll take a little while, yeah. Minister. Um, but prime, these are the where the the Europe fight is about its use in agriculture. Let's be honest. Okay. It's about okay. corn, wheat, soy. Okay. Right, and then other, you know, other drivers impact on pollinators, impact on butterflies and bees. It's a big, big region and a big, big debate. Um, and but then a couple of countries have said, like for example, forestry in Germany and France won't be able to use it. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, on the next slide, consensus statement health scientists in 2016, do you have any of the values or science on the concentration amounts? It talks about glyphosate being found here or there or, or in different locations, whether it be in water, precipitation, air, et cetera. Do we have concentration levels of what is being found in those areas? What they've done with this consensus statement, Minister, through you, um, Chair, um, is taken a, a look at over 250 peer-reviewed scientific journals, so some of that data is in there. Um, I think if those scientists were here testifying to you, they would say, don't get distracted by concentration levels. Okay. Um, mostly because the concentration levels on the label were deemed to be safe. Now we know they're not. If we keep going, just going down and fiddling with concentration instead of getting to the point, which is phasing out its use, um, we'll be distracted for another 30 years. So it's not, I, under, I appreciate when industry says we use less, less of it than even what is legally allowed. We use less per acre in the forest than, we, than most farmers do on their, on their crops. On the other hand, we're not growing food, we're growing paper tissue paper and paper um, in the Crown Forest and farmers have other, uh, and farmers don't spray from helicopters. Okay. Um, as it relates to Quebec, uh, do we have any stats on what the impact on the per hectare yield of wood fiber was as a there, result of the change? That's in actually in this 2011 paper and they found that it, it was affected but not dramatically. So when when the scientist says that, um, what did they say here, it didn't affect supply, um, it, I can tell you that the numbers on the other side of the equation, the jobs went way up as you can imagine. Um, and all I know is that the, the big companies that operate in the Quebec forest are not walking away from that access to Crown land. Think of those big companies that operate there. And so they must be making some money. A lot of them are, are publicly traded as well. Okay. And you know who would have that answer to that question? Who would have that? Is your peeps. Okay. Okay. His, his people at DNR could provide that answer because it's included in part of um, the Canada Forest, Forest Service. Long, remember that long-term data that I showed you from 1991 of how much timber was taken, how much, you know, square meters and tons, that's all there. So they're feeding that up to the feds. Okay. I just have one more question and then I'll yield any other further time. As it relates to the slide on what's driving government action, when it comes, because this is a uh, presentation related to forestry, when it comes to lawsuits, do you have the context of the lawsuits? There's a lot of action and stuff going on down the states uh, related to commercial use and whatnot. Do you, do you have any context of, of what the industry is that's generating? It's primarily the folks who spray it, Minister. So it's lawn care workers and agricultural workers that are driving, and that because they are the people with the cancer. Yeah. I mean, these are people who are dying, who are already dead, and have suffered severe different types of cancer okay. that have brought class action suits forward. Um, and that, but it is really having an impact when you see these government after government review um, popping mm -hmm. up because they, they're huge, they're huge impacts. Yeah. And if there's 10 more minutes over here, whatever, whoever wants to. Anybody? We do have time probably for one more question uh, from the uh, government side. Okay. <coughs> well, we'll have to find one more question then. <laughs> Go ahead. Just a, a small question. Uh, just looking at, first of all, I, want, I think it's rich that the uh, Atlantic Salmon Federation is on board with, uh, with eliminating glyphosate, but it's okay to put rotenone in Miramichi Lake. So that's just my personal little dig. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, Ms. Corbett, do you have a percentage of the total acreage forested? You were in, in the very first uh, slide, or second slide, I guess it is. We have uh, the total forest sprayed with glyphosate for 2014. But I think that it would be valuable to know what the acreage in those areas is total 
to create a percentage, like what percentage is actually of the of the grand forest, for example, in British Columbia, is being sprayed using glyphosate? Um, I don't have that data right at my fingertips, Minister, but um, I definitely can get back to you on Could it again. It's in that source, sure. so that, you know, basically it would be crown forest plus private woodlots, and right. that's what the medical officer of health used to push those two numbers together. Okay. And the data source that she used was Canada Forest Service okay. data. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, we can. We're going to switch now. Thank you. Over here, uh, Minister Holland and Minister Johnson, and we're going to have um, MLA Laundry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being here this morning. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, I want to, if we go back to the slide on what New Brunswickers say about the state of their forest. Uh, that's a survey that uh, the Conservation Council has undertaken. 87% wants the government to keep promise for more protected land. Mm -hmm. Could you explain sure. what is protected land? Sure, so that's area that governments, federal, or provincial, or even municipal set aside for the purpose of nature, okay, so that you can't clear cut. So that is what Minister Holland and his staff, New Brunswick always lagged behind protected areas. We were, as, as recently as three years ago, uh, protecting only about 4.5. So Mount Carlton, Funding National Park, um, plus the protected areas under provincial jurisdiction. Okay, um, Jacket River things, there's a whole map of them on the department site. And so it made a commitment uh, uh, to protect 10% by 2021, even though science says we need to get to 25% and 30% by 2030. Um, and so the Department of Natural Resources has undertaken a uh, review of assets, primarily in the, in the Crown Forest. It said this area is good for conservation because it has remnant stands of the Acadian Forest, or this has is home or habitat to endangered species. So this is a big wetland and we should protect it. So gradually, and I know that some people within the biology uh, wing of the Department of Natural Resources are working hard to move this bar up to 10%, um, hopefully by this year. Haven't seen any regulations go to cabinet setting these lands aside yet, but I'm sure they're coming. The minister may be reviewing drafts of them right now for all I know. So, uh, but we've got to keep, that's the nature crisis that I was talking to you about. We've lagged. Even when we get to 10%, we'll still be behind Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Quebec. So we've got a lot of catch up to do in New Brunswick. What's kept us behind? This tension between using our crown lands as forest timber supply or for nature's sake. That's what's prevented this change. Uh, can you explain what is permitted and not permitted on protected so lands? So you can ski do, you be, in lots of places you can hunt um, and fish. Um, you can't clear cut, okay. you can't spray glyphosate, and sometimes you can't mine. Mining's a bit of an issue, it, okay. a bit of a Issue point still, I find it ridiculous. You set aside a protected area and go in and put a big pit in it. You're not really kind of protecting nature, but um, I know that it, mineral rights are a different issue. So, but that people get to use it. Um, it's just you can't um, clear, you can't, industry can't clear cut it. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the answer. That's what I was looking for, and I know the government is looking at increasing the percentage of protected uh, and Protected you know what, line. though, uh, through, through the chair, um, Ms. Landry, we have to make sure that that information about you, you will still be able to enjoy this land, gets yeah. out to the people. Yes. Because I have seen some suggested protected areas derailed at the last minute because um, recreational users were thinking that it was going to be taken away from them, and that's not, that's just not true. So, it's kind of incumbent on all of us to make sure that, that um, we're not taking, we're actually protecting nature for the people. We're not taking 
um, area of the province away from them. Okay. Um, I was surprised to hear that uh, when during your presentation that uh, the government or the taxpayers of New Brunswick are paying for spraying. Uh, I, I don't know if you have um, 23 million. 23 million for uh, not just for spraying for all silviculture. It is uh, is. Not, is the New Brunswick also uh, is the industry paying as well? It is some mm. money coming from uh, private donors or? That's you know? a good question, and I don't think so. Not on the crown. I'm not sure about their freeholds. I'm not sure about that at all. Maybe that's a question you can ask officials from the okay. Department of Natural Resources. The industry does pump money into their uh, nurseries, tree nurseries, things like that, okay. for sure. But uh, the, that, when the Auditor General reviewed practices, remember mm -hmm. the highlights of her report, not just this February, but five years ago, um, she noted that the, the size of clear cuts was continuing to grow in the yeah. Crown Fours, and that the government was still paying for silviculture without very much proof that um, it was, you know, a bang for buck. Okay. And the last uh, question I have is regarding your recommendation about uh, appointing a chief forester. Mm -hmm. uh, what would uh, that person do that we don't do right now? Well, that's true. There's an awful lot of foresters that work in the Department of Natural Resources and they have a um, high skill level. All across the country, um, the Crown Lands and Forest Acts have been amended um, to put with an eye towards more fairness and more ecosystem protection um, in um, their legislation in almost every jurisdiction except New Brunswick. British Columbia is now on its third revision since 1982. Quebec's already done three revisions since 1982, but for some reason New Brunswick skipped the things. Those uh, major revisions in British Columbia, Ontario, for example, also included provisions for the establishment of community-owned uh, force um, and force management. Yeah. And so we've skipped, though, we've skipped that review process all together in New Brunswick. And I would argue that we've missed some, uh, we've definitely missed that layer of ecosystem protection. So what they, and it was through those reviews that this appointed of, appointment of a chief forester came about. And that was to hold someone to account in the legislature on how are these big plans working? How are they meeting the expectations of citizens' involvement, First Nations' involvement? And how are you dealing with this whole raft of new science, new science, new science, new science? So it's very much um, a role that's been adopted in other uh, um, other jurisdiction. And it seems, and for example, in Quebec, I think the Chief Forester reports annually, I could be wrong about that, it could be every five years, but you get this big report yeah. um, from the Chief Forester saying we need to tweak this, we need to tweak that. Thank you. Uh, I'll uh, pass to my colleague. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Leblanc. Thank you. Mr. Leblanc. Thank you, Mrs. Corbett, for being here. Um, I also uh, want to uh, ask a few questions, just mainly on the recommendation side. Okay. Um, you know, on the uh, reform of uh, reforming the Crown Land and Forestry Act, uh, the recommendations you outlined, you know, there's six of them. It's basically a soft recommendation. What would be your first hard recommendation? I would say the hard one. Can I have two? Pardon? Can I have two? You can have three. Dramatically reduce the size of allowable clear cuts in the Crown Forest. That will get you at, you don't need herbicides anymore, ban herbicides, and get out there and talk to the people. The department officials, the minister himself, and ministers before him were good at talking to stakeholders and industry, but the people have not been engaged on this file for quite some time, with the exception of protesting, and protesting should be seen as the last resort. People in New Brunswick care about their force, and you've got to trust them. They've got boots, hard boots, a lot of them, mm -hmm. on the ground. So public so, consultation, so to, to, to ban, to... reduce. Okay, so thank you. So how does uh, industry, government, 
and people, how do we come together to, to create that trust? I know reform, but how, it's probably going to be through um, a transparent dialogue. But how, how do you play, how do you see that role when, in, in reforming this, this Crown Act? To you, um, uh, Mr. Chair, that is such a good question and it's a tough one. But I, I'm concerned that people have lost their trust in government when it comes to managing their Crown force. So the first thing that you do is you stop digging that hole. And it, we've got to confront them. And we've got to talk to them. And I can tell you, if you go out with ideas that are dramatic and bold in leadership, like phasing out pesticides, you will get, you will still get some of those grumpy people, I understand that. But you will help forge a public consideration and good policy around the love of the force. Go out on the love part. Don't go out on the hate part. Go out on the love part and start talking um, to the peeps. Thank you. I wish I, I, I had more questions. I'll come back. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, who's next? Mr. Kuhn, go ahead. You've got uh, 10 minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning uh, to our presenters. Thank you, Ms. Corbett, for your presentation. Um, so, as you pointed out, there's a uh, ever-growing body of evidence of the of the uh, risks associated in the, uh, with the use of glyphosate uh, ecologically to wildlife to human health um, and the damage it can do. Um, I feel like we've seen this story before, kind of like that movie Groundhog Day, you know, where herbicides and other pesticides, uh, like insecticides, but um, but you mentioned 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T and they get used and they get used and they get used and, and the evidence starts to mount in the literature that there are problems with it even though they went through the regulatory process and were deemed safe if you follow the label until they're not uh, anymore. And then the body of evidence finally reaches the point where government, the regulator, takes action and deregisters them or bans them. Um, and we've seen that over and over and over with different uh, pesticide products. Uh, that happened with 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, uh, which were widely used on the forest. That happened with phenytrithion, which was being used for uh, budworm. Uh, and, uh, of course, an insecticide in that case. Uh, and the list is long. And here we are again with glyphosate, uh, which has been used for quite a long time now. And the evidence <laughs> the science has, has started to reach a, a, a point where uh, you've got to say, why is this still permitted uh, in Canada by, for these uses uh, on forests, for example, by Health Canada? So can you speak to the regulatory process? Because what happens regularly is simply we hear, well, it's gone through the regulatory process, and so it's, it's good. It's got the stamp of approval from the Government of Canada, and uh, there are no problems with it as a result. Right. So, um, thank you for the question. Um, lots of folks may not have had an opportunity, but if you do get to a beach or your favorite lake and, and you're not fishing and you'd like to read, um, I would highly recommend that you read um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring not just because she was the first scientist that really came out and said, whoa, this you know, regulated use of chemicals is really bad, but there is a New Brunswick chapter. There is a New Brunswick chapter called Rivers to the Sea, which is about the, comp the, the province's experiment using DDT and its impact on salmon. And so it's very relevant to you peeps, even if it was published in 1961, it's still relevant. The story about DDT, of course, and I think it's still okay to cite it, because we're finding it in New Brunswick's lakes in places that we were not supposed to find it at all, um, is that the New Brunswick government banned it before the federal government. In fact, when you look at the history of 
herbicides and pesticides being taken off the shelf, you'll almost invariably find in Canada that a province will move first and then Health Canada because it's facing pressures and different laws in, uh, you know, from the big you know, different provinces will come in and remove it for sale. The same is true to DDT. New Brunswick stopped using it before it was banned. So you do have the power um, to, to move this step. Obviously Quebec did, so you know that that, and municipalities do, that court case was taken all the way um, to the um, Supreme Court. These, the companies are selling us a product and it is in their interest, I would say, um, to make sure that regu regulatory authorities have their science and not independently funded science out there in the field. We, for years, were told that um, DDT would not, sh and, and 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T and glyphosate would not show up in water. And now science is showing that it's, that it, it, it's popping up in water. We were shown that it would not concentrate in harmful levels in soils and kill insects that we need to keep the soil healthy to grow other crops, including trees. Um, and now we're finding it popping up. So this is how lag in science, lack of independent research, and a captured, I hate to use that term, but it is, regulatory agencies at a big, wide national level have, have repeated the cycle time and time again, um, Mr. Kuhn, and until we really wrestle with it and say we don't need this so-called tool, we'll be stuck in that them, us, them, us debate. So we need to rise above um, Bayer Chemicals Science and other science papers and just so say we don't need it, let's move forward. So thank you. Uh, with respect to the regulatory process, though, um, there, there's so we, when, when a product is first registered, obviously there's little field experience with it because it hasn't been approved. Um, the, the history of this is that once it's been used for multiple, many years in the, in the, in the real world um, and independent studies and start to be done, then we start to see evidence of problems. Uh, one of the most recent um, is around the impacts on subsequent generations of wildlife or humans, if it's, a, if it's a direct exposure of humans, but of wildlife as well, where, um, you know, a, a recent uh, paper was, was published, which um, this is called uh, uh, epigenetic, looking at the, the epigenetics of the situation, which means that, you know, the, the original uh, organism exposed to the spray uh, doesn't get sick, but subsequent generations uh, of their progeny do develop disease related to their exposure. Um, and uh, it's, it has to do with um, how the, the genes are expressed um, in subsequent generations and the expression of those genes is affected by the original exposure. Uh, of the original organized, organism exposed. Anyways, point is, um, this is kind of the, the latest sorts of impacts of pesticides, including this particular paper on glyphosate, um, which was published in 2019. So, uh, what, in, in the review process, I mean, every so often it seems, you know, a registered product like glyphosate gets reviewed by the federal regulatory agency, and then it gets its stamp of approval again. Um, but the, this, this, the science never seems to win the day until it's overwhelmingly irrefutable. Mm -hmm. uh, so why is that? Well, I, I think that's why um, other scientists and conservationists like the Conservation Council would always ur urge legislature to use the precautionary principle. If all the data is not in front of you, then at least err on the side of precaution as opposed to willy-nilly use and broad, and broad spread use. Um, because I don't think there's a magic solution to that, David, um, um, Mr. Kuhn, sorry. Um, so, and our, and, and the, this, but the rash of the new evidence showing how it's accumulated in water and, and uh, uh, fruits and berries and in um, stems in force and in soil 
is outrageously alarming to me. And certainly the IARC report gave quite a boost to toxicologists and epidemiologists and a lot of new work is coming out there. And if you, um, precaution and pre the precautionary principle is only written into one piece of our legislation as far as I know in the province, which is um, the Endangered Species Act, the Species at Risk Act. So err on the side of precaution. But what you have been practicing for the last 16 months is precaution. You're washing your hands, you're wearing masks. We've adapted all of society to this principle of, um, n of trying to reduce your risk threshold and interfere and, and adopt new habits. And it's not quite an apple to apple comparison, but you have been cautious your Chief Medical Officer of Health, your Premier gave us a video on how to wash our hands. Now that was, for me, early on in COVID, the epitome of precaution. And in this case, that is the scientific principle that I think you want to line your recommendations up alongside. Let's err on the side of caution, and let's be bold in our leadership. There was uh, something called the Monsanto Papers, it's called the Monsanto Papers, it has to do with the original science carried out by, by Monsanto when it was the company that, that first developed glyphosate and, and, and registered it. Uh, can you speak to what happened there, what, sure. what those were I mean, about? Sorry, I remember 10 minutes has run out. I hadn't realized it now, so we're going to have to move on to the next questioner. And as another precaution, some of you, and including myself, we got to wear a mask unless we're having a drink or scratching our chin or whatever. We still have to keep those on. Next up, we've got uh, for the uh, People's Alliance, uh, we have the uh, Chris Austin, MLA Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Talk about precaution. I think the mask thing is a little over the top at this point, but anyway, I'll follow the rules. Um, I do just want to drill down a little bit on um, the issue around the ban in Quebec that, that took place. And I guess what we hear from forestry, from, from the industry here, is if you ban glyphosate on Crown land, it's going to um, greatly impact the economic outcome uh, of the forestry industry in New Brunswick. Now, obviously, Quebec has done it. And you made an interesting comment to say, you know, forestry didn't walk away when they banned glyphosate. They found other ways. So are you aware of what those other ways were and how that transition happened? And maybe give us a little more detail of how the forest industry in Quebec, from what you know and you understand, has made that transition from, um, you know, the use of glyphosate to not using glyphosate? The, the, what I know about it um, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Austin, is that it was phased in so that companies could adjust, get different types of uh, machinery and hire up crews. Um, and it was phased in over quite a long period of time, so that uh, um, eight years, I, I believe, from the original recommendation, five years from when government approved the policy. And when you think about um, the forest companies, think of Resolute. Okay, a big international forest company that operates in northern Quebec and in northern Ontario. Thousands and thousands of people employed by that um, corporation and hundreds and hundreds, millions of square, um, um, uh, square foot of timber used and a very successful company. That's kind of, I didn't mention that, uh, uh, Mr. Austin, but it's also that uh, kind of other perfect storm going out out there, you know, like plywood's like worth more than my house now, that kind of stuff. You got this perfect storm of economic opportunity as well. Look, I can tell you, they will bellyache about it. They did in Quebec as well. They will bellyache. But we have to believe that standing up for good public policy that prevents health problems in the future, that protects the nature of our crown force, and that includes the people will serve them as well over the long term. 
We will not see a dramatic decrease in timber supply as a result of this one public policy move. We will see more jobs created in the forests. We know that. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, I think I've made my position clear on this many times in the past. I think we are on the same page in that regard. Um, I've always said, you know, people that are working in the industry would be certainly increased if, if you took away um, glyphosate spraying. Um, I guess another argument industry will use, and, and I do think they have a reasonable argument in this case, is the difference between forestry and agriculture. And I know you alluded to that and mentioned that specifically in your presentation. Um, you know, they say, you know, we spray the trees, but you don't eat trees. You know, you spray the potatoes, which you do eat, and corn and everything else. Um, can you maybe drill down a little bit with the difference between, and, and I, from what I understand, the Conser Conservation Council's position is to ban it on agriculture and crown land. But we're here talking about crown land, so can you maybe help differentiate the two and why it's important to go forward with, or at least, you know, discuss this idea of, of banning on crown land as opposed to agriculture use? Sure. That's a very good question, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the key difference is the helicopter and therefore the drift. So New Brunswick farmers don't spray any more um, from helicopters or aircraft like they did when I was a kid growing up in Carlton County in the potato belt, right? Um, they become much more precise in their application. It's really too expensive, that and fertilizer, to waste. So they've gotten a young man that uh, farms my dad's farm and grows potatoes for McCain's can show me exactly that meter by meter area that needed some fertilizers and how the rest of the field didn't need it at all. That's a dramatic difference from when I was helping dad seed on the back of a cedar with the bag going in with those big discs. Remember those things? Whew, that was hard work. But so there, it's used much more differently. Farmers are concerned too, not just about exposure to pesticides and increased reliance on uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers, um, but you need entirely different strategies. You gotta work hand in hand with your, with your farm community to help them back out of the use and the reliance on pesticides. And I think that that can be done too. And the reason is not just for nature and to protect the St. John River or the streams where Atlantic salmon swim, but because that's where their buyers are going. Whether it's McCain and McDonald's for french fries, whether it's Kellogg's for oats, soy, and corn, that's where people's consumers' choices are going, and we'd be well served to support agricultural reduction um, as quickly as we can. And as you know, there's a growing demand for organic produce and, small, and, and produce from small farms, and the more we can do to help that grow, so to speak, in New Brunswick, um, the better we'd all be served. Okay, thank you uh, for that. I think the other key difference, if I could, is that we are not growing food in the Crown Forest. We are growing stumpy old um, um, spruce and fir for um, paper products, and there, that, that is a difference. And, and what I find interesting is that Quebec is also struggling with the use of glyphosate in its agriculture community right now. Their legislature has a committee set up and because they've found um, a remnants of glyphosate-based herbicides in the, Saint John, in the St. Lawrence River, and they're increasingly concerned, and their citizens are driving that concern. Yeah, thank you, and I, and I agree. I, they, they are two different things. I mean, one, we're talking about the people's land, crown land, in, in relation to the forest versus private land, uh, which is often the case with agriculture. Um, you know, they, they are two different, uh, two different things. And, you know, I guess my opinion is, you know, we see the, uh, the report put out here a few years ago about, uh, you know, being a probable carcinogen. Um, we see more studies coming, we see lawsuits in the U.S. that are successful in relation to that. So th there, there is a difference, um, but I think, you know, if you look at the broader scale, if the issue is with glyphosate, the issue is with glyphosate, whether it's forest or agriculture. So the question is how do we deal with both, um, relating to impacts to both, to ensure that, uh, 
we can you know move on from this herbicide in general. I just wanted to uh, give a couple minutes left. Um, the Conservation Council had hosted a retired professor, Dr. David Coombs, uh, to provide a presentation on glyphosate causing DNA damage several years ago. I'm just wondering if you could sure. um, give us some idea of, of uh, about that presentation. Um, maybe a little bit about Dr. David Coombs, a little bit of his background and, and his credibility and credentials, and uh, what you kind of took from, from that presentation. Well, he's one of the lead, leading scientific um, um, experts in, in New Brunswick. He's retired now, um, Mr. Austin. He was um, alerting our membership um, to his concerns about genetic mutations, about cancers, about the big questions that at that time science wasn't adequately um, representing. My takeaway from those presentations and other work that he's done is be scared, be very scared. That, um, and he keeps up to date on, the, on all the scientific literature and he also commented on how we don't hear this from our officials. So I think those would be the, the key points that uh, Dr. David Coombs made to, to me and to other people um, over the years, um, that, and especially the point on, on there's an awful lot more about its health impact at the genetic level that we don't know yet. So the question would be, do you wait until we know that it caused mutagenic cancers? I mean, that means cancer passed on to offspring. Right, through genes? Or do you um, act on the precaution principle, which is let's not wait, let's move forward, let's get it out of our toolbox right now. The other thing that I wanted to mention to you, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Austin, was I have been a a around this public policy debate on the use of chemicals in forestry and in agriculture almost my entire career. And every time some government tries to ban it in forestry, we hear from industry about how you can't ban it in forestry because people use it on their lawns. So then the provinces go out and ban the use, the cosmetic use on their lawns. And now you can't ban it in forestry because we use a little cup full of it, this much on New Brunswick's blueberry crops. So you can't do anything. So we have to be concerned about um, squirrels running across the desk here that says um, you can't do anything unless you're going to do it all. That is an unfair ultimatum. What you want to do is capture that big use first, see how it works, figure out your policy tools that you've used, regulation or policy statements and help the other users bring it right down quickly as well. Because when you've got that success, the big use in the Crown Forest, the other ones will come um, quickly after that. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. You, um, Mr. Austin, I believe. Yes. And uh, to the Conservation Council, we'll give you a few minutes to get your things. But we really appreciate your presentation. Like all of us here, I wish we had, uh, we could ask three more weeks of questions just to you, but we have a week of